invite you to Hebrews this morning, chapter 12, and the paragraph we'll consider does begin in verse 14, where we have a direct command, once again in verse 14, to follow, that is to pursue. The word is to strive for peace with all men, peace with all, verse 14 of Hebrews 12. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, verse 15, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I mentioned in our prayer that it's easy for us to come back to the Lord's table and either just stop thinking about what we're doing, or to come to the Lord's table and not really understand what we're doing. I'd say most of us fall somewhere in the middle in between those, but, but there is a spectrum, isn't there? And, and that is one of the challenges for us, is that when we come back to the Lord's table, that we remember in the biblical sense that we call to mind again why this matters, what this pictures, and why this is important. And we really do see some of what the Lord would have us to see as we look at these verses together. There is a command for us. We are commanded to show Christ's work. We're commanded to show Christ's work. Strive to live out what Christ has achieved. We're told here to follow, to pursue, to strive for. That is the word, to strive for peace with all, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We've read about the peace that we're talking about. When we hear the word peace, what we usually think of is quiet, tranquil, absence of conflict. I'm for those things, by the way. My personality loves those things, especially when when people get together. I don't want anybody mad at anybody. I want everybody to get along. I want everybody to be nice to each other. That's what I want. And there is an element when we talk about peace that, that, yeah, that's included. We want to be in good relationship with one another. But the peace that is being emphasized here, pursue peace, is made possible only because of the peace that we read about in Ephesians chapter 2. And that's the peace that Jesus Christ himself has purchased for me with God. It's the peace that Paul wrote about when he wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And not only that, but we have access into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's the peace that Christ has purchased. We read that again in Ephesians 2, where Christ, verse 14, Christ himself is our peace peace. I was separated from God by my sin. I was away from Him. I was, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we read, I was without God and without hope in the world. But God stepped in. God sent Jesus. And Jesus came and did for me what I could not do. Jesus purchased with His own blood the peace that I need before God So we are called here to pursue peace. To pursue peace not because, well, we just like it better that way. To to pursue peace not because everybody is easy to get along with. Not because we all see everything exactly the same way. But we are called to pursue peace because Christ has purchased peace. We're called to pursue peace because Christ has made peace. Peace. That's the image we see there in Ephesians 2. Between Jew and Gentile. I, I don't know how, how much a greater human distinction there can be. 
Paul said we've got those who are Jews and those who are not Jews. And Christ has made peace between both. So that we're both able to come to God by His Spirit through Jesus Christ. If He's able to take those two disparate groups and bring them together in Jesus, how much more should we be able to see that same dynamic of unity in Christ worked out in a body of believers? Pursue this. Strive for this. Strive for peace because Christ has made peace. And that's going to demand a personal effort on my part. That's going to demand relational effort. I love that Ephesians chapter 4 tells us to lead with kindness. Lead with that. To lead with humility all the way through. We see descriptions of what it means to live out the gospel. And it always starts with humility. Listen, when I can step back and remember what Jesus did... For me, why is it that I have any right to approach a holy God? I don't in myself. But Jesus came and took my sin. And Jesus took his perfect holiness and covered me with it. I'm able to come to God because of Jesus. I'm able to come to the Father through the Son. And I'm reminded, as Peter wrote, that we offer up sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What is it that makes what we're doing today acceptable? If God's going to accept your worship and mine, if God's going to accept our worship, there's only one reason He'll do that. And that's because we're approaching Him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. He's made peace. So we should pursue that peace. Together we lead with Kindness, as I mentioned, Ephesians chapter 4, put away all those sinful expressions of reactionary anger, verses 30 and 31, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We lead with humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Paul told us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. The gospel puts me back in my place. I was separated from God till Jesus did his work. So peace, pursue it because Christ has made peace. And this peace includes my relationships with others in this gospel community, in this church. It is, if I could use a math term, and I hate math, if I could use math, it is incongruous. Doesn't match. For me to come here today and declare and rejoice in my peace with God through Jesus Christ while maintaining a spirit of division with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those don't go together. We are commanded to show Christ's work, strive to live out what Christ has achieved, this peace that he has made, strive for peace And strive for holiness. That same verb, that same command covers both of those words. Strive for peace and strive for holiness. So we need to strive to live as those that Christ owns. And when I say strive for holiness, does that include our behavior? Certainly. But I do think in this passage, the emphasis is more on our position before God as holy in Christ Jesus than it is on our behavior. We've got to live that out consistently. We want to live in a way that matches. That's what Paul said to the Ephesians elsewhere is live in a manner that becomes, or said to the Philippians, live in a manner that adorns the gospel, that demonstrates the reality of it. Surely our lifestyle should back up the profession that we make. But we're called here to strive to live as those that Christ owns. Holiness here, this is my position before God in Christ. I'm not holy. I know it's the convention and people do it, and I don't correct people when they do it, but I hate to be called reverend. Just, why? Well, you know me. (laughs) There's nothing to be revered up here. And Scripture tells us that there's only one reverend, and that's Jesus Christ. He is my righteousness. He is my holiness. So because He has purchased my right standing before God, I am free 
joyfully and thankfully to pursue the holiness of Jesus Christ, to seek to live that out, not so that I can earn God's favor, but because Christ has already purchased it. And I want to live toward that and pursue that in Him because He's already done it right. So we're told here to strive for peace and to strive for holiness. And the truth for you and for me is this. Without holiness in our life and in our body, without holiness in our life and in our body, Christ will not be seen by those who look at our lives and our church. The writer says, strive for peace and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If we're not walking as holy believers pursuing a holy God, then people who need Christ and look at us and look at our church can't see Him. But the other emphasis here of this idea without holiness, no one will see the Lord should speak to you and to me to say that I have no reason for confidence that I belong to Christ's church without holiness flowing from my life. I've said before, there are two things Christians do, right? Lots of things we do, but two big things we do. Christians repent. And Christians forgive. If you're not willing to pursue forgiveness as God directs, why, why do you think you're a Christian? I didn't say you're not. I said, why do you think you are? Because Christians forgive. If you're not willing to repent when confronted with sin, why do you think you're a Christian? Because Christians repent. And we keep repenting. We do sin, don't we? We sin because we're fallen. We sin because we're still carting this flesh around. But the response from the heart of a child of God is to say, God, forgive me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. Forgive my sin. I don't want this. I want you. If that's not coming out of your life, why do you think you're a Christian? Without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. And it's not holiness you can produce for yourself. It's something Christ produces and has purchased for us and places upon us and produces from the inside out. If that's not what you're seeing in your life, you don't have any confidence, any reason for confidence in your relationship with Him. So we're commanded to show Christ's work. True peace, the peace that Christ has purchased will promote holiness and a pursuit of holiness is the basis for our peace with one another. That's a great picture as we approach the Lord's table, isn't it? Because what we're saying here is that this is where Jesus purchased my peace. I'm remembering that His body was broken in my place. I'm remembering that His blood was poured out for me. He is my peace. He is my holiness. As we come to the table today, we're commanded to show Christ's work. And we're told here to do this together. We're commanded to strive together. And that's the understanding of the construction here in verse 14. As we read it, just a natural reading, follow peace with all and holiness. It's, we, we read that and say, okay, yeah, try to be at peace with everybody. Paul says that elsewhere. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, If it be possible, as much as lies with you, live peaceably with all men. Right? He says that. The emphasis and understanding here is all of you together strive for peace and holiness. Strive for peace, all of you. Together strive for this. That's the construction that Paul uses here. So once again, we consider the, the, the source of that command. The only way you and I can have a common peace is if we have a common peacemaker. How many times have you heard me say, there are many things about which our church will never speak with one voice. But we'd better all be able to speak with one voice about what makes unites us to God and unites us to one another. It ought to be the reality that I have more in common 
with someone who is in Christ, even if they don't vote the same way I do, than I have with somebody who is not in Christ who votes the same way I do. But what pulls us together? What is it that I find my unity in? You understand an unsaved world is fine gathering together over shared preferences. People who don't know God from a goose are able to gather together against a common enemy. But the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is it pulls together people that have no earthly reason to be together except they've been saved by the same Jesus. And we're to strive to show that, to demonstrate that, to live that together, pursue that. Consider the scope here of this command. Pursue this, strive for this, follow this. That is exhausting because it never stops. And it's costly. And once again, we have an indication here. Once again, we have a passage that reminds us what God has called you to do as a believer, you cannot do in isolation. You cannot do this by yourself. All of you strive together by yourself. That doesn't work. I don't need to connect myself to a church. I'm just part of the body of Christ. Not according to this. We do this together. It's going to require that we humble ourselves repeatedly. How easy is it for us to gather and immediately start finding fault, looking down our nose. Well, I'm better than. Well, they're not as good as me. Why is he reading scripture? Why is she sitting down with that person to study the Bible together? I know more than she does. Who are you sharing your vast knowledge with? See, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to humble ourselves. Will you pursue humility? Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to, to, to open yourself? And I don't mean let's stand up and share my dirty laundry with everybody or post all my insecurities on Facebook. Please don't do that. But is there anybody who knows Christ and knows you well enough to be able to look you in the eye and say, what's wrong? What's going on? Is there anybody in your life that knows Christ and knows you? Is there anybody in your life that's allowed to tell you the truth? See, that's the other thing that happens. Sometimes there are people that love you and want to tell you the truth, but the truth isn't easy. Slap them enough times, they'll stop coming. Are you willing to open yourself? Pastor who made this statement years ago. He said, if you get a scratch on your soul seeking reconciliation, think about that image for a second. It's kind of what I just mentioned. Yeah, it, it's costly. Try to reach out to somebody who's hurting. Sometimes they don't respond well. Try to reach out to somebody who's moving in a wrong direction. Sometimes they don't respond well. But if you get a scratch on your soul seeking reconciliation, take it as the wounds on Christ's back for you. So that comes back to the gospel, doesn't it? Why would I pursue this person at personal risk? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for me. And I didn't deserve it. But he came after me. My personal peace and holiness will impact yours. Yours will impact mine. We see it in sports all the time where you've got somebody who's on a team and they decide for whatever reason that they're more important than everybody else, right? So what happens when they decide, I'm just not going to cooperate? What happens when they decide, I'm just going to do what's best for me? Well, at the end of the year, that individual gets the championship trophy and the rest of the team doesn't, right? That's how that, no. If a team fails to play together, who loses? It's not the individual. It's the team. Sometimes it's hard to play together, isn't it? 
But I would challenge you to consider what is it that's making it hard? See, the beauty of a local church, for example, is not everybody fits in every local church. God, the, God's doing different things with different bodies, and we give, give Him some room and some grace. Romans 14 is really important, right? I may not see eye to eye with how this believer is doing it, but I trust the Lord to hold him up, and he trusts the Lord to hold me up, even though we may do a couple of things differently. Not the important gospel stuff, but where to dot that I and how to cross that T. We, we may do that a little differently, and that's okay. I've mentioned years in years past, yeah, I've, I've met some people that are so open and accepting. They'll fit in at any church. It doesn't matter. As long as they're talking about Jesus, as long as they hear a Bible verse once in a while, they're fine. We're all, it's all fine. That, that's, that's not a good extreme. But you know what? I've met other people that are so self-righteous, they don't fit in any church. No church is good enough for them. Neither one of those are good. And neither one of those really understand the gospel. Neither one of those are living out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're commanded to show Christ's work. And this is where it gets hard. Oh, it wasn't yet? <laughs> but we're commanded to shepherd each other. We are commanded to shepherd each other. Where do you get that idea? Verse 14 says to pursue peace with all, pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Do this looking diligently. For some of your translations, they start a new sentence there. They say, look diligently or, or, or see to it. The idea here is here's how you pursue, holy, pr pursue peace and holiness by looking out for these things. There's something interesting about this word here. We're commanded to shepherd each other. You are here to shepherd Love all the amens. You are here to shepherd. Here's an example of when you're translating from one language into another, sometimes it takes more than one word in the, tar in, in the target language to communicate what's going on in the original language. And sometimes you can translate that word in different ways for different emphasis. And that's what we have right here. The word for looking diligently or seeing to it is one word in the original language, kind of a compound word, and Paul uses this and Peter uses it elsewhere. We're familiar with this word in a different context. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes in verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here's my command to you elders, pastors, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. The word taking the oversight there is the word we get our, it's, if you want the Greek, episkopos. It's from episkopos. And episcopal. We get our word bishop from that idea, taking the oversight. So he writes to those who are pastors and says, here's what I'm telling you elders to do. You elders, shepherd, feed the flock of God that is among you, and do so taking the oversight. So I'm writing to you pastors, you elders, feed the flock and do so taking the oversight. Well, here's what's interesting. He's writing here in Hebrews 12 and verse 15, and he says, I want all of you, he's not writing, this is not a direct address to pastors, he's writing to the church. All of you, strive, for peace, strive together for peace and holiness and do so looking diligently, seeing to it, taking the oversight. It's the same word. It's the same word. The traditional understanding in our circles is that the reason a church has a pastor is to preach on Sunday, come see me when I'm sick, be in the hospital if I've got a problem. Now, those are things a pastor wants to do and likes to do and is able to do and enjoys doing to a degree. But understand, communicating and encouraging and strengthening and exhorting one another in the word, visiting and supporting one another in sickness, counseling one another with the wisdom of God's word are all commands that show up in the New Testament that are given to every single believer. 
It's not my job because I'm the pastor. It's my job because I'm a believer. The unique function, and we see it in Ephesians chapter 4, that God gives to the pastor is the oversight of the whole flock to see that that's happening, but also is the equipping of the saints for that work of the ministry. That's Ephesians 4. So I'm supposed to be doing those things, but I'm supposed to be here as a pastor to equip you to do those things. You are called to take the oversight of yourself and of one another. You are here to shepherd. Episcopeo describes one who is literally a watchman upon the sheep. Someone who is constantly, diligently, actively, responsibly overseeing the care of the sheep in their flock. It's not the only duty of shepherding that Peter mentions, but it is one. It's also used to think of those who are, who are target shooting, to taking, shooting at a target, taking aim at the market, careful looking. It's in the plural here. It's everyone's responsibility to make sure, see to it, that no one misses the grace of God. There's one writer said, all of you act like bishops in seeing that no one succumbs to gracelessness. In other words, the writer's urging what you might call some sanctified meddling in others' lives. Consciously involving ourselves in the body of Christ. Assuming responsibility for seeing others go on in grace. And also humbly receiving their loving care for us. All of us need grace to finish this race. And we are each God's instruments in each other's lives. And no one person is going to be sufficient for every person. But every person should be involved with somebody else. There must be a constant watch, Manton said, kept not only over our own hearts, but also over the congregations to which we belong. Members must take care of one another. This is the communion between the saints. And as we gather here today to observe the Lord's table, we are declaring our communion with Christ. We're also declaring our communion with one another. That's the picture. We're commanded to shepherd each other. You are here to shepherd. Now, maybe you're not here to shepherd. But God says that's why he has you here. What shape does that take? What does that look like? What are we focusing on here? Well, we want to shepherd one another toward God's grace. Look at these last couple verses here. All of you see to it. Take the oversight. Act like a shepherd. Act like a bishop here. Look diligently so that these things don't happen. Look diligently so that no one fail of the grace of God. Look diligently so that no root of bitterness springs up, troubles you. Be diligent so that no one is a fornicator or profane person like Esau. We need to shepherd one another toward God's grace. There is a danger that some in our midst... Maybe even some here today could miss the grace of God. I think the primary idea of the writer here, as he's writing to the Hebrews, we've talked about this, he's writing to people who came out of a Jewish background to Christ. And now they're worshiping and following Jesus, but it's hard. It's really hard. And the pressure that they're feeling, both positive and negative, there's a, there's a pull that they're feeling to say, you know what, maybe it's just too hard to follow Jesus. Maybe I should just go back to doing Judaism like I used to. Well, the reality is, if I'm able to just turn away and walk back, then I was never genuinely in Christ to begin with. And it's hard for us to tell the difference from the outside. We can't. We can't see the heart. But the writer of the Hebrews here is warning serves warning against his hearers to say, don't turn back, don't fall away. And he's saying to one another, we need to look out for each other because some may. So that as, as we would say it in our day here, there are some who are unsaved, but they're watching. They're not in Christ, but they're looking at those who are. They're considering and they're asking questions. Is this real? Is this true? Should I pursue this? And where are they looking? Well, they're not looking into the Bible necessarily, but they're looking at you. They're looking at me. 
And they're not looking at what I do on Sunday. They're looking at how I respond when people mistreat me. They're looking at how I respond when I don't get what I want. They're looking at how I respond when life takes a turn I didn't expect because if Christ isn't real there, then He's not real. There are those who are unsaved, but they're watching. I think that's the emphasis of the passage here. But there's an application for you and me today too, and that is some are saved, but they're wavering. We're in Christ, yeah, but life's hard, and we're wavering. I can hinder the working of God's grace in the life of another by my sinful and irresponsible living. We sin against each other and get in God's way. remember a pastor a few years ago, he made a statement, he said, I'm convinced God really wants to bless our churches if we could just figure out how to get out of his way. I think that's true here as well. We want to shepherd one another toward God's grace. Some are unsaved, but they're watching. Some are saved, but, but they're wavering. <clears throat> and we need to demonstrate the reality of the gospel to show them the truth. Shepherd one another toward God's grace and then shepherd one another toward godliness. There's some hard words here that we don't like the sound of in our day and age. But he says here to see to it lest anyone miss The grace of God. I don't want anyone sitting here today to miss the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want anyone sitting here today to miss the reality that you can be made right with God through Jesus. I don't want anyone to miss that. And I don't want anyone who is in Christ to miss the truth that you can continue to be faithful to Him. Don't want anybody to miss that. So in my dealings with you, in your dealings with me, we want to continue to shepherd each other in that direction. Don't turn around. Don't, don't, don't fall away. There's, there's something here that we need to point back toward. Shepherd one another back to grace. Shepherd one another toward godliness. That's going to take a shape. Let me spend a little time here in these last couple of verses before we wrap up. Shepherd one another toward godliness. We're told here to root out unbelief. To root out Unbelief. He says, lest there be any root of bitterness springing up that troubles you, and thereby many be defiled. For sake of time, I won't go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 29. I'd like to, and I'd invite you to do that at some point. But there, the the writer here is quoting or, or referencing that passage. And if you go back and read that passage, what the writer is talking about is that there are people who are experiencing the blessing of God, but they're turning away from it. And they're turning away from the worship of the true and living God to pursue false gods. And they're convincing themselves that they're just fine, even though God sees the reality of their heart. He's not telling us here that we need to avoid being bitter against each other, although we do. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us clearly, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. It is unchristian for you to maintain an attitude of bitterness toward another person. Christians don't do that without repenting. But in this passage, he's not talking about bitterness. He's talking about a bitter root, a poisonous root. You know, there's some plants, if you eat them, you die. They're poisonous. They cause problems. And when you go back to Deuteronomy 29, what you see is that poisonous root is unbelief. I've stopped believing God, and I'm going my own direction instead of His. That is the bitter root. That is the poisonous root. And we're told here, beware and watch out for one another so that that poisonous root doesn't spring up and cause problems and defile many. Watch out for unbelief. Root out unbelief. This unbelief flows from unfaithfulness. We don't want there to be, he says, any fornicator. The word there is, well, the Greek word is pornos. We get our word pornography. So it's a direct term for sexual immorality. Sometimes it's used more specifically or more broadly. But here he says, see to it that that not be present in your body. Talk about some sanctified meddling. 
But see to it that that's not there. But as we look at this context here, the immoral person here is one that is completely governed by the desires of his flesh. There may be a broader sense of this word here, broader than just sexual sin. I think the, the context here, verse 15, points this way, beware of unbelief. And this next word combines well with this idea. He says, this unbelief flows from unfaithfulness. I think we see the word more broadly, the idea of apostasy, of turning away, going my own way and not God's way. And this next word here, unbelief, flows from carelessness. The word, lest there be any fornicator, verse 16, or profane person. The word profane is it's immoral or worldly. It describes someone or something that disregards what is kept to be sacred or holy. Stay with me just for a minute. We're almost done here. It describes someone who disregards what is supposed to be kept sacred or holy. Profane describes a mindset that takes little notice of anything beyond the material. What I can see, feel, touch, taste. That's really all I'm concerned about. That's the profane person. The worldly person. Beware lest there's somebody unholy. That which is profane. That which is without God. A godless person. As we said, the profane person takes little notice of anything beyond the material. When we are dealing with one another in our body, do we know and interact with people in our body who basically, they don't really care what God says. It's all about what I can think, what I think, what I see, what I feel, what I want, what feels good right now. That's what I'm living for. That's a profane person. And if that's what I'm living for, that does lead me to stop separating between what is good and what's not. It does lead me to say, you know what, if I've got to choose between pleasing God or pleasing me, I'll just please me. Where does that go eventually? I'm just not going to follow God at all. This is a secular mentality. Little time for worship or service, but I'm intent upon material gain. I'm intent upon earthly advantage. It's all about right here. It's all about right now. That's a profane person. And we are told to watch out among each other so that, that, so that we don't get there. And again, I would say this shows up primarily and first and foremost in our responses to what comes in our life. And people who have been, quote, good church people all their lives. I mentioned last Sunday, I used to have a you know, professor in Bible college, used to do the old joke. Said they, they don't dip, dance, or chew, or run with those that do. They follow all the rules. But when somebody crosses them, I cross them right back. If I don't get what I want, I go after what I want. I don't care what God says about it. Maybe you're keeping those external rules, but what's the response of your heart? Is it actually in conformity to the holiness of Christ, or is it just like the world? Is it for here and now? That's the profane person, like Esau. Consider Esau here. We don't have time to go back and read the story, but he comes from the field. He's been hunting. He's starving. He's hungry, and his younger brother Jacob has made some good chili, and Esau says, oh, I want some of that chili. And Esau says, or Jacob says, I tell you what, why don't you sell me your birthright? Now, wait a minute. The birthright belonged to the oldest son. The birthright gave him the right as the descendant and heir of the father and control of the entire estate. And in that day and age, in that setting, he was essentially the family's priest before God, if you will. And consider the promise that had been made to Esau's father, Isaac. There's going to, through, through his father Abraham, there's going to be one who's going to come from you who will be the blessing to all the world. We know now that was Jesus Christ. And Jacob says to Esau, hey, I'll give you some chili if you will sell me your birthright. Let me have that place. And Esau's response, well, what, good's it, well, what good is it to me if I starve to death? Sure, you can have it, fine. And sells his birthright for a bowl of chili. And then later, later on, of course, he's deceived when it comes time for his father to pass on the blessing. And there he weeps and cries and pursues. But Esau present, presents a perfect picture to us of one who sacrifices the eternal on the altar of the immediate. That phrase isn't original to me. 
How many times have you and I done the same thing? We sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. What I want, what I think, what I feel right this minute. Esau pictures that for us. And Esau pictures for us worldly sorrow rather than godly sorrow, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We read that last phrase in verse 17. He found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And some have understood that to say he was seeking repentance. That's not the picture here. It's too late for him to change his mind. It's too late for him to undo what he's done. He is not disappointed that he's displeased God. He's disappointed that he's cheated himself. And he's sorry about it. He's sad over it. But his priorities really haven't changed. And you can see that if you go back and read the account. You can see that in his responses. It's everybody else's fault, not mine. As we come to this table today, we are called, commanded, to show the work of Christ. We're commanded to show His work and we're commanded to shepherd each other. And as we come to this table today, we're reminded that we are called by faith to Christ. We come to Him and we're called to come to Him together. And so I would challenge you today as we approach this table, I'm making a declaration. I'm declaring as I take this bread and as I take this cup that when Christ's body was broken, it was broken for me. When his blood was spilled out, it was spilled out for me. I have participated in his death and burial and resurrection. I've been placed into him. I am his. And I come to this table today as one who belongs to him. I'm saying that. I'm also saying that I come to this table because I've been placed into Christ. And I come to this table to declare my communion with Christ and those that belong to Christ. I come to this table declaring I have received God's grace and that I desire to be an instrument of His grace as well. So let me caution you. This is familiar for many of us, but let me caution you again. If you are not in Christ or not certain that you're in Christ, you don't need bread and juice. You need actual forgiveness through repentant faith in Jesus Christ. Don't worry about these. If people, when this comes by and it's offered to you, let it pass. You don't need this. You don't need bread and juice. You need real forgiveness. And you can find that in Jesus today. These elements picture that truth. So if you're not in Christ, don't take this. Just, just let it go. It's fine. Let it go. I would challenge you today... If, if maybe you've got, as a believer, you've got a very, very active conscience and every time that we come to communion, you're sitting here struggling, oh, should I take? I don't know if I'm good enough to take. Let me give you a short. You're not good enough to take. None of us are. If you're able to come to this table today saying, I, yeah, I've been carting this flesh around all week, but, every, but I repent. That's what I do. I'm seeking to please Christ. I'm seeking to live for Him. That's my heart, and that's what I'm desiring. And as I come to this table today, I'm saying He has forgiven me and placed me into Him, and I'm saying as well, I need His grace every day for my right standing before God. Did you have enough devotion time this week? No, you didn't. Come to the table. Did you keep your cool and never lose your temper one time this week? No, you didn't. Come to the table. Confess that to the Lord and come to the table. Did you keep your thought life pure and never have one bad thought enter your mind all week? No, you didn't. Come to the table. But if God's been after you about something, if there's an area in your life where he has convicted you and you continue to say, no, I'm just not doing it your way. I know what your word says. I'm just not going to do it. That's different. Don't take this until you get that right. If you're telling him no about anything, don't touch this until you tell him yes. And I do think that's what Paul had reference to when he said, let a man examine himself. And having done so, let's eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Our passage today calls us to show Christ's work and to shepherd one another. He calls us to Christ together. So with that in mind,
Let's prepare our hearts and our minds today to come to the table.